Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Anna Mazze. Currently, she is an outpatient dietitian providing education on diabetes and weight management and has also been a certified diabetes educator for more than 10 years. So to define what is Latino, I think the words Hispanic and Latino are used interchangeably, but the Census Bureau defines it, every, anybody who has, is from these countries here or has a background from these countries. So everything from Mexico all the way to Dominican Republic. Okay, so I want to just first look at the statistics on diabetes because some of the cultures have a higher rate just genetically prone to have diabetes so it's most important for them to not add insult to injury by making better choices and having healthier habits throughout their life. So I think you might have seen this already but the prevalence of diabetes based on information from 2015 is that that's 30 million people in the US adults. Okay so that's slightly more than the population of Texas that volume of people. And for people who have prediabetes, based on information from 2015, it's twice the population of California who have prediabetes. So they're on the edge of becoming diabetics. Okay? So it's actually a little bit more than the population of two times the population of California. Okay? So when you look at it broken down by race and ethnicity, you can see here, for example, that we focused in on Southeast Asian cookery because 8% of those people have diabetes. When you look at the Spanish population, 12% have diabetes. So even when you break the Hispanic population down further, you can see that close to 14% of Mexican Americans have diabetes. So most of the Latino Hispanic population in California is, are from Mexico. So we really want to focus in on that cuisine tonight. All right. So when you look at somebody's traditional dietary habits, they're always changing depending on their circumstances in life. If you stay in the same town that you grew up in, you may not change that much, but there may be influence from people moving in from other areas. Your diet can change depending on people living in your household, like maybe you have a grandmother who continues on traditional foods, or younger people bringing other foods in the house that may not be such a good thing. So adopting Positive habits are adopting things that aren't so good for you, too, as you move along. So when I think of Mexican cooking, our foods from Mexico, I think of spicy or hot foods, which I really like. But I also think of freshness and lots of color, okay? Now, there's some good and bad things about everybody's traditional foods, but we want to emphasize what's great and kind of modify what's not so great, right? So in my mind, in the Mexican cuisine, like I said, the heat, all those spices, oregano, cumin, the use of herbs like cilantro are really bringing a brightness to the food and the citrus, lime, lemon, that kind of thing. Also, I don't think that they usually, even though this picture shows them having steak, typically I don't picture Mexican food like that. It's small pieces of meat tucked away in something. The, it's their equivalent of a sandwich is a taco or flautas or tamale or enchiladas, burritos, these types of things. Also, it seems like they have a lot of comfort food where they have soups and stews. So some of that meat is just cooking slowly in the, in the stew or soup and getting all tender. So it's a lot of comfort food in, to me in that cuisine. Of course, there can be some downsides like there might be a lot of frying going on and not as many vegetables as I think that they could probably work in. So let's take a look at some of the guidelines around this cuisine and some of the changes that need to be made and some of the things to hang on to and embrace. These are the things that you want to have less often, right? Okay, because they're going to lead to a high, high blood sugar, right? So the, every culture has their equivalent of junk food and these may be some things that you've seen before. So you have the churros in the back, lots of sweet beverages, 
Some of these beverages, it's interesting, they're made from, this one in the far, on the far left there is made from tamarind. And then also the one that says tikama. I think that that is made from hibiscus flowers. They you make soda drinks out of those hibiscus flower and the tamarind pods, and they're very sweet. But I'm thinking that, you know, I, when you go to the stores, you can buy the tamarind pod. You can buy hibiscus flower and do something similar, but maybe not add sugar. You could add a sugar substitute if you really missed having something like that. And of course, these are, I think I'm saying it right, the concha looks like a shell. Okay, those are very refined desserts made with white flour and sugar. So these are the kinds of things that just shoot that blood sugar right up. So you want to use these things much less often, okay? Harchata is the rice drink that is used in the Mexican culture, okay? So let's start with basic guidelines about portion control because that is the most important thing that's going to impact blood sugar is portion control of carbohydrate foods. And we're going to look at the different carbohydrate foods, specifically those that might be consumed in the Mexican cuisine. So when you look at, we often use this, this idea of plate method to help people understand the portions they should have. This is a nine inch plate, and if you could see a quarter of the plate has something that might be familiar, beans and a tortilla in that corner. Okay, so that's the portion control option there. Then the other quarter of the plate has chicken or fish there or some kind of protein food, and half the plate is vegetables. So really pushing those vegetables. Another kind of crude way of determining how much you should have at a meal is using your hand as, a por uh, as something to measure. Your hand is equal to the portion you should have. So for example, this amount of rice is what I should have. This is my fist, this is the amount of rice I should have. Okay, the portion of meat I should have should be the size of my palm, okay? So another kind of not specific, but it's some guideline for you when you're out and about at a restaurant or going to somebody else's home to eat or at a party or something. Something to use there and look to see that this is a half a cup and this, your fist, a tight fist is a whole cup, all right? Now, if you're a man with a big hand, you might have to, it might be a cup and a half, but maybe that's okay for you because of your size, okay? So it's proportional for you. So other basic guidelines is to select the most nutritious carbohydrate foods, okay? Yeah, let's just say you control the portion, but the type of carbohydrate food is very processed. Processed types of carbohydrate foods, the ones I showed you on that first slide are the ones that are gonna turn into blood sugar very quickly, just flood your bloodstream with blood sugar. So you want to have foods that aren't so processed and include a variety of different carbohydrate foods to get all the nutrients you need. And not just carbohydrate foods, but other foods at the meal. Going back to that plate, you wanna get a variety of food at the meal to get all the nutrients you need. Now, if you're wondering how uh, a food affects your blood sugar, let's say you, you can't give up something, you really wanna see if you can work it into your meal plan. So let's say you have a meal where you cut back a little bit on the rice at the meal because you want a dessert. The thing to do is to check your blood sugar before you eat the meal, and then two hours after you eat. It should spike much more than maybe 50 or 60 points. Okay, so there are some foods that I might say, that it sounds like it's gonna raise your blood sugar, but the best way you're gonna know is if you try it yourself. Okay, and even a portion, you may be able to tolerate a larger portion than you think of a carbohydrate food, all right? Also, you want to make sure that when you look at your method, methods of cooking, you wanna lighten those up because you also want to control calorie intake because weight gain can also increase your risk for diabetes and also worsen blood sugar control if you have diabetes. So in general, when you look at a recipe, you can reduce the amount of fat by a third to a half, okay? And then each time you make it, you, try, you play with it a little bit and see how much further you can go down until it doesn't taste as good as, as well as you'd like it to taste. And look for other options for fat using vegetable oil sprays to spray the pan so they don't stick, using some kind of broth, maybe some wine or something like that, a citrus. And the method of cooking that you wanna look at is getting away from fried foods, baking, barbecuing, grilling, broiling, stir fry, those kinds of methods of cooking most often. Once in a while you're gonna have something that might be deep fat fried, okay? Pan frying and sauteing is not so bad, but it's really when it's soaking in the oil. You also want to select lean protein sources, which we're going to look at, and lower fat dairy products. So let's talk about the first food group that does contain carbohydrates, which are grains and bread products. So 
you want to select more often whole grains. So your bread, crackers, noodles, cereals, you want them to come from a whole grain. The first ingredient should read a hundred, a whole, like 100% whole wheat or whole rye or whole barley or whole corn. It should, that should be the first ingredient, okay? You want to get away from those refined or processed grains that I, I talked about. So in fideo are noodles. Now, the way that those are prepared is they look like a spaghetti, but they're smaller. I guess they, so they're probably processed, but additionally, what, the way they cook them is that it is an oil. They saute them in a lot of oil first, okay? So there's a method of cooking that you don't want to do. And maybe get whole grain noodles and boil those and maybe add a little oil instead of cooking it in the oil. And of course, rice is a popular item in, around the world and especially in the Latino cuisine. Instead of white rice, go to the brown rice. Just like brown rice more often. So a way to maybe get used to having brown rice is to have a little white and a little brown. Mix it up first. And then you think, hey, I can handle it. I'll have more brown rice. Then the next thing you might want to look at is trying something like quinoa. And quinoa was, is originally from South America and has become very popular here. Now, underneath the brown rice, I have riced cauliflower. Some of you might have already seen that at the store, they're taking cauliflower and breaking it down so it looks like little pieces of rice. You could do that at home, too, in a Cuisinart. You're diluting out your portion of rice, okay? And all the nutritional breakdown is on that recipe, too. Instead of white tortillas, go for whole wheat tortillas. It looks like you guys are ready to experiment with a different item, so that's great. Now, corn tortillas are not really whole grain. But I like it because the size is small. They're usually uniform. Flour tortillas vary in size. When you go to the store, some look, I mean, they're, they're quite large. They're worth maybe three pieces of bread when you have those tortillas. So they come in all sizes and thickness. So I think the corn tortillas are more consistent. That's why I like them, even though they're really not a whole grain, the type of cornmeal they use. So speaking of talking about that, let's look at cornmeal because Somebody might wonder, what's the difference between all these different cornmeals? There's grits, which is made from a specific type of corn. And in the South and the American South, that's where people have, you know, grits in the morning for breakfast. That's very popular. Polenta, Italians eat polenta. It's made from a different corn. I think it's ground finer than the grits. And then masa is made from a particular type of corn. And then the corn is soaked in lye or some kind of alkaline solution and it puffs up and it looks bigger. But in doing that, you remove a lot of the outer portion of it, the hull, and you lose some of the brand that would normally be in the product. But that's what they make the, the tortillas out of and tamales out of, that, that masa is what it's called, masa harina. And for tamales, I said that, tortillas. And if you can look for stone, stone ground cornmeal, which has the whole kernel there, okay? So this is when we talk about what is a whole grain. It's because you're keeping the outer layer. You're keeping that bran. The bran has fiber, not only fiber, but other vitamins and minerals that, that are not there when you take that off. And same with the germ. The germ has essential oils in there and phytochemicals and other healthy fats. But those are removed when you process a grain. And that happens with the, with the corn. Because what's left is the refined grain, all that endosperm is all starch. So it's easily digested and easily turns into blood sugar because you've removed that outer shell. Okay? So that's why we constantly encourage the whole grain. The U.S. Dietary Guidelines encourage people to at least have half of their grains being whole grains. Okay? So let's look at starchy vegetables. Beginning with the bean is the queen of starchy vegetables, really because it has so much nutrition to offer. At the top it says, it's one of the top 10 superfoods for people following a diabetes meal plan. Because of the complex carbohydrates in it, the type of carbohydrate that's in it breaks down more slowly, so it doesn't spike blood sugar like other starchy foods, okay? And it does, besides the complex carbohydrates that are in there that don't spike, it's also rich in fiber. It's fat-free, free of saturated fat, free of cholesterol, sodium, okay? high in iron and zinc, rich in these omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, and they're inexpensive source of protein. So this is a centerpiece to the Mexican cuisine, which is great. So hang on to eating those things and vary the type of bean. 
But of course, the method, how you're cooking it, is something else too. We have to look at that a little closer. What's being added to the beans? Okay, other starchy vegetables might be things you're familiar with, peas, potatoes, maybe not so familiar, plantains, yucca, and ca or cassava is another name for that, all right? Now, I have that fist there again to remind you of portion power, right? Okay, again, these are starchy vegetables like rice or noodles, so you have to pay attention to how much you have of those. I have a picture of a, a yucca plant down there. The plantains, the yucca are used in different ways. They're mashed up, they're cut up and added to stews, they're fried. So it's a pretty starchy product. These are other non-starchy vegetables that are very colorful and interesting to you know, experiment with. So of course tomatoes, tomatillos are a, related to the tomato family, but when you cut into them, they have a, a thicker kind of liquid in them. And even if you see salsa verde, it's a little thicker. Jicama, you're gonna, uh, which is a big, has everybody tried jicama? Typically in the Mexican cuisine, they cut that up and they put chili powder on it and maybe a little lime. So chayote is more like a zucchini. Has anybody had chayote here? Okay, so not, not a strong flavor, but it's like a, it's like a zucchini, a squash. Many chilies, right? Serrano chilies, jalapeno, and they use them fresh, dried, and they're rehydrated in sauces. Right, and then they have nopales, which is the cactus, but you have to take out all the thorns in it. Sometimes they come with the thorns out. And it also has that same kind of consistency, like very viscous, and it's known to help with blood sugar control. And maybe in the future they will devise a portion or the liquid that's in it that people should have to lower blood sugar because there has been some studies that shows that it, it does help. So you eat the tortilla, the blood sugar goes up a little bit, but the cactus brings it down. Yeah, I've had patients use that, but it's a very interesting experience because I mean, it was really sticky like glue uh, when I took off the little thorns and then barbecued it. So other non-starchy vegetables that, they, that is, are used are this variety here that are common that people know about. But again, colorful and I would say they're usually used in like a salad except for like a coleslaw. Most often it's more like a topping I've seen a lot of these vegetables being used. So in general I would say because vegetables are used in soups and stews is to concentrate them there. Stay with the traditional st uh, s uh, soup or stew but add more carrots, add more of the chayote, add the cabbage. So concentrate on adding those things and explore and have maybe making a, a green salad, but using ingredients that you're familiar with and spices that you're familiar with, like a Mexican or Latino type of dressing for yourself. Using, you know, carrots and celery are commonly used for snacks for people and they dip it in ranch dressing, but you could dip it in, in salsa or guacamole. And interesting, I went to a store the other day, they had guacamole mixed with some Greek yogurt and it was pretty good, but less calories. So actually it was pretty tasty. And of course, I think that grilling them really brings out another flavor. So during the summertime, grilling the zucchini and, and the, the chayote and that type of thing. And again, the, the cactus paddle. All right. so. Looking at fruits, they use a variety of fruits in that cuisine, citrus, lemon, lime. These are fruits that you are familiar with. So more often you want to have fresh fruits and again, portion control. So a piece of fruit about the size of a tennis ball is one portion. Okay, so apple, anything roundish, apple, orange, persimmon, that type of thing. <clears throat> and if you're going to buy canned fruit, you want to have them packed in their own juice using less juices really should only use a juice if you're having a low blood sugar okay and smoothies for example when people make fruit smoothies you're kind of pre-digesting the fruit so again it's going to get go through the system faster and probably get into the bloodstream more quickly and spike blood sugar avoid canned and heavy syrup that type of thing and again you want to pay attention to portion control all right and so these are some fruits you may not be familiar with that are common in the Mexican cuisine. And then star fruit, you might be familiar with, that is a, a tropical fruit. Okay, so that's the prickly pear, which sits on top of the cactus. Mm -hmm. Right, so the cactus has the cactus paddles and then you see these. 
at the top. Right, but you'd be really careful picking those because the thorns are super fine like a hair, but they get everywhere. We live in the Bay Area and we're privy to so many different types of foods and cultures. And if you go to some of these Mexican grocery stores, they have these. So pick one up and try it, explore, okay? Looking at dairy products, you wanna go from having whole milk less often and go to 1% or non-fat for milk and even evaporated milk. Cause I know that that's used in some things like flan, right? And now cheese, in the California, when we go to a Mexican restaurant, it seems like it's always just that grated cheddar cheese. They sell a mixture of cheeses at the store in bags already shredded for you. Some of them come low fat, so I have a bag over there and you can taste some of that. But they're kind of mild cheeses. In the Mexican cuisine, they actually have a lot more cheeses that people don't know about, okay? So the queso blanco and the queso fresco and the chihuahua, cotija, okay? So these are very kind of crumbly cheeses. Now, I, I like those because a little is gonna go a long way. Right, they're crumbly, they give you a little, uh, a little punch of salt so that in whatever you're cooking, you don't add as much salt, but if you crumble that on top, you're gonna get a little bit of that salt taste and the cheese taste. Oaxaca, okay. That looks more like a string cheese. Uh, it is made from lower fat milk too, okay? But in general, cheeses in any culture, you have to be careful with the portion because it can be very calorie dense, all right? So going back to dairy products, the selecting low fat or non fat sour cream or creamers or even cream cheese more often than the regular sour cream or the crema. Okay, it is higher fat than sour cream. So that's what I'm saying. People might say, oh, that's going to not taste good, is to be open minded. If you're used to having that higher fat crema, the, the light sour cream, you might be able to say, hey, it's not so bad. I'm going to start using that. You're going to cut out a lot of fat. Okay? by switching out. And less of that sweetened condensed milk, that's used in a lot of, I think, drinks and in desserts too, okay? So protein foods. So you wanna select more often beans, okay? That's the centerpiece of the, the, that, uh, the Mexican diet, as I said. But after that, seafood. And typically it's, I was talking to a, one of our chefs who is from Mexico, most of the time he says the fish is usually pan fried, not deep fat fried, but pan fried. So you're not gonna really find battered and fried seafood. But when people move here, they might start having, you know, a fried fish, battered and fried fish, okay? But at home, in their own culture, they might be doing a pan fry. Ceviche is a, a great dish too. There's no fat in that. A lot of the fish is just sort of what we call cooked because the protein has changed because you've added acid from lemon or lime. Okay, the reason why the Heart Association is really pushing seafood at least twice a week, two four ounce portions, is because of the omega-3 fatty acids in fish. It's not just that the oils there are lower cholesterol. They play another role in being cardioprotective by reducing the risk of blood clots and preventing inflammation in your arteries, okay? So there's a reason why you wanna really embrace having more seafood. So when it comes to chicken, beef, pork, lamb, all those, the Heart Association is saying you don't need much more than maybe close to six ounces a day of, cooked, of a cooked portion. They want you to do more of the seafood and more vegetarian. But if you're gonna select poultry products, you do wanna select breast and don't eat the skin. And if you're gonna select ground beef, it should be at least 90% fat free. Okay, and same with turkey because sometimes the turkey can be high fat because they put, they put the skins back in and grind it all up together and select lean cuts of meat. So the terms, the kind of description on the package might say round, loin, sirloin, or chuck, those are leaner cuts. Those are gonna be not as marble with fat. So they're gonna be tougher, so you might wanna marinate them, mechanically pound them, or like put them in soups or stews and slow cook them, so that way they don't, they're not so tough, okay? Also, there's a grating of meat, and when you this time of year people have prime rib, and the reason why it's prime is because it's juicy because of that marbling throughout the meat. The grades of choice and select are less expensive, but a little tougher. They're not as marbled also. I put soy crumbles down there because some of these restaurants are starting to make, well, they're calling it sofrito, which is kind of a spicy, crumbly, it looks like hamburger meat, 
but they're adding the kind of spices that you might find maybe in, in sofrito, which is a, another kind of mixture, into the soy crumbles. So there's a chain restaurant that does offer that instead of a meat, okay? So the things you wanna have less often are the, process, are the high fat meats and processed meats. They're gonna be higher in saturated fat, which raises blood cholesterol, and they're gonna be higher in sodium also, okay? So again, here's that three ounce portion at a meal, the, the size and thickness of the palm of your hand. Now, when you look, go to the store, you can see which cuts of meat are gonna be more fatty. You can see that this has less marbling in it on the far right there, and you can see on the far left that it's more marbled. It's gonna be juicier, but it's gonna have much more saturated fat. So you wanna trim the fat off the meat, and you wanna to keep to the right portion size. With soup or stew, gravies, let it get cold, and take the fat off the top. That hard fat is the saturated fat that contributes to high cholesterol, okay? And when we talk about fats, the reason why you want to use less of all fats is because it's a concentrated source of calories. And going back to weight management, as I said, that increasing weight, especially as we age, increases your risk for diabetes and can worsen blood sugar. They're a concentrated source of calories. When you look at a tablespoon of butter, oil, these things, even shortening, it's about 120 calories a tablespoon compared to sugar, which is pure carbohydrate, right? So it's, half the it's more than half, less than half the calories, okay? So you want to select more, but in general, the healthier or cardioprotective fats are, you want to select more often. The vegetable oils like canola and olive oil, if you're going to use margarine, you want to use a soft tub margarine, not a stick margarine. Typically, saturated fat is the type of fats that are hard at room temperature. Okay, so lard, shortening, coconut palm oil, those are hard at room temperature. Sometimes if you put an oil in the refrigerator, like if you put olive oil in the refrigerator, you could see what little saturated fat that's there starts to come together. If you put canola oil in the refrigerator, it's the lowest in saturated fat. You can't see anything coming together in there. Okay, so other healthy fats are things like nuts and nut butters. What's used in the Mexican cuisine are pumpkin seeds a lot. Of course, avocados for guacamole. A mayonnaise is made of oil and eggs, so it really isn't really that high in saturated fat. And for salad dressings, you want to use an oil-based, not, not a cream-based, like blue cheese, ranch. Those are going to be probably higher in saturated fat, okay? So let's take a look at our first recipe, the empanadas. So let's take a look at what makes this special, the empanadas, okay? Typically empanadas can be savory or sweet. The, the dough is made out of the cornmeal, not, not stone ground, and I'd like to try that. And there's also white flour. And the next time I make this, I might add a little bit of whole wheat flour instead of a cup of, of, of white flour, just to see, again, modifying the recipe to see if I can make it healthier, okay? So we're filling it up, up not with just all meat, but we're also adding the vegetables there too, okay? Now, what makes any crust lovely is the flakiness of it. And you get that flakiness when you're using a solid fat like lard or butter or shortening. So instead of doing that, they, they asked for a soft tub margarine that has a good percent of oil, but is still solid when it's in the refrigerator. What's in them? You've had sweet empanadas, but what are they filled with? Pumpkin. Pumpkin? Maple what? Maple syrup? No, sugar. Sugar. All right, so I mean, I'm sure that tastes very good. Uh, and of course, they're not fried. Bake them. So we're saving on calories because they're not fried. We're saving on saturated fat because we're using this soft, this, uh, this type of margarine that is, gives us not as much saturated fat and trans fats. All right, and then our next recipe, carnitas. Okay. So it's a pork shoulder, which isn't as lean, but also the way it's cooked is that it's cooked in oil and just, it's not fried, but it's just sitting in oil and cooking a long time. So it just melts in your mouth, right? So instead we try to get a similar kind of texture with the pork loin, which is much leaner, and slow cook it in a crock pot, okay? So it has a lot of different seasonings in it. Yeah, I rubbed the, rubbed the pork loin with those things. It actually, if you have a you know, thermometer at home, measure the temperature, 145 to 160. It's gonna be not overdone, okay? 
and I'd say two and a half hours maybe for this amount, which is a, a two and a half pounds, okay, of the pork loin, all right? So, oh, I didn't want to move that. So this is how carnitas looks, right? Delicious. All right, so let me talk a little bit more about pork because there is a concern about, that lingers about trichinosis in our culture, which is, can be found in pork, but a lot of other, usually in the wild. But uh, commercially farmed pork is very low risk of trichinosis because of regulations around the feed, around the, the, plant, where the, uh, the, uh, the plant where the animals grow, so and keeping pe other pests out. So it is well regulated now, but this is just might be inter it's interesting for you to know that well done is 160. So medium rare is the 145 to 150 range. And I had definitely this cooked into the 150s. Because also with the pork carnitas is that once you shred it, I've had some people put it back in the pan and fry it up. So it gets a little crispy, okay? All right, so looking at the next, to freshen it up a little bit, we have the coleslaw. So I wanted to just also include this because, again, I want to push more fruit, more vegetables into this cuisine. And when we look at this recipe, initially it had two cups of cabbage, but I put it down to one cup of, and I specify red cabbage because I wanted that color, okay? Because also the jicama is white that's in there and then the carrot, so it gives it a lot of color. Now that it's been sitting in its dressing, I think some of the colors have bled out. But if you're gonna use green cabbage, I would say use the Savoy, which is easier to cut and a little bit more tender. Because I do prefer cabbage, my preference is to have it real, sliced really thinly and it's kind of hard to do that with the heavier cabbage, the red and the green. Right, because you can mix the different things up. Like I added jicama because I thought maybe some people have never tried jicama, which is very watery. When I shredded, when I was shredding it, I could just, it was, I had to kind of drain out a lot of the water but it's very refreshing. You can cook your long grain brown rice, which is more whole grain in a rice cooker, and you could cook it in, a, in some kind of chicken broth, beef broth, or vegetable broth. So once you add that rice, if you've sauteed this riced cauliflower, you can mix a half, you can mix a whole cup of, a half a cup of the, the cauliflower rice with a half a cup of the uh, regular rice, and you've cut the carbohydrate in half. So if you look at the nutrient breakdown, one cup, you're only getting, you're getting 29 grams of carb. And you could do that, you could go further and add less rice to the cauliflowered rice. You could play with the ratio more.